started with our fifth in our series of webinars on rural water supply. So I'm very pleased to welcome you all. And for those of you that perhaps are joining for the first time, joining us for the first time, let me assure you that all webinars are recorded. This webinar will be posted on our website um, within a few hours of um, are finishing today and all previous webinars are there. You have all at some point or another gotten a uh, email from us that has this green get more information button on it. So if you click that, that will take you to our website and you can find all of the information uh, you want. So here's today's program. Uh, let me call your attention to the fact that we have a question and answer segment, and that's when Jonathan and the discussants will respond to your questions and comments from the chat box. You don't have to wait for that session to begin, though. Please feel free to start writing uh, questions and comments during the presentation and the uh, discussant remarks. Our, our presenter and the discussants, however, will only respond to those questions over the, their microphones during the question and answer. Uh, period. And as you can see, we encourage you to, um, if you if you feel more comfortable typing in French, uh, please do so. We can we can handle that. So let me move on to introductions, and I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Elizabeth. I am sitting here in the World Bank headquarters in Washington D.C., and I'm the moderator today and also the manager of the webinar series. Uh, sitting right next to me is Su Jung Yu, who is controlling the whole um, screen and the webinar uh, session. And then we have Army in a different part of the building who will intervene if any of you have technical um, problems. We have sitting in Switzerland, we have Kirsten and Sean, who will be um, looking after your questions and making sure that we reach as many of them as we possibly can. And then we have our discussants. Sylvain, I believe, is sitting in Cotonou. He's somewhere in Benin. Uh, Christophe is sitting right next to us here in our office in headquarters. And Alain, I believe, is sitting in his home somewhere in northern Virginia in the Washington, D.C. region. And finally, we have our presenter, who I believe is sitting somewhere in Madagascar. I know is sitting somewhere in Madagascar. I'm not completely sure um, where. So before we go on and get started, let's find out just a little bit about you. If you could type in the chat box and tell us where you are right now, um, either the city or the country or whatever, uh, we'd be interested in learning about that. Well, I can see that Mike is from the USA. Somebody from Minneapolis. Well, that's good. Oh, good. Some some Madagascar. Pr pr um, Participation, Bolivia, uh, the Netherlands, London, Alain, as I said, um, is in Washington, Pakistan, Lausanne, Switzerland, Amsterdam, more um, Bethesda. Oh, hi, Telma. I know Telma. Um, Florida. Oh, good. University of Southern Florida. Glad to have that. Dakar. Great to have you. I think this is should be um, very interesting for those of you in Francophone Africa. Nepal. Great. Another Madagascar, New York, Dar es Salaam, Habari Zaleo Huko, Dar es Salaam, Nigeria. I can see we're also getting some um, people that have been here before, so we're very happy to uh, welcome everybody. Um, Su Jung, could you tell us a little bit about the statistics on our webinar series? Okay. Yes, Elizabeth. Um, so. Um, as of today, we have uh, 1,200 people subscribed for the for the entire webinar series. And today, uh, on our sixth webinar, we have uh, 47 people uh, participating. Okay. Thank you very much. 47. I'm quite sure that that will continue to rise as more people log in. So um, today we'd like to get a little bit of your feedback from you about how we structure our webinar. This won't affect today's webinar, but it will affect future webinars. And what we'd like to know is what is it that you value about the webinars? Do you want to spend more time listening to the presentation and hearing discussants comments? Or do you want to, us to spend more time 
um, answering uh, questions and comments uh, from you. So if you could just give us a, a, a sense of what you prefer. If you say 50 minutes for presentation and discussion, that means we know that you really want us to, st to spend more time uh, sending out, broadcasting to you uh, messages from our participants. If you put um, 20, if you take the third answer, then of course you're telling us that what you really want is a chance to speak and interact with our presenters, and or you can settle for something in the middle. So if you could just quickly answer that, um, it will give us a sense, and also you'll tell each other what it is that you value about this webinar series. So I see at the moment it's sort of like almost kind of split, but at, it seems to be people are saying the uh, they value both. Let's split it between presentations and uh, and discussant remarks. Ooh, yes, that's winning. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. We'll keep that in mind, but that will be in future webinars because um, today we have um, already structured the webinar. And I hope that you will enjoy it. I am sure that you will enjoy it. So we have uh, Jonathan talking um, today. And um, let me give you a little bit of a background on him. Jonathan holds a Bachelor of Science and a Master's Degree in Environmental Engineering. He has worked at all levels of programming, including the design, implementation, and management of multi-year WASH projects financed by USAID. Jonathan's professional interests include encouraging public-private partnerships between municipalities and service providers, as well as building capacity at decentralized levels of government. Jonathan represents CARE International as the technical coordinator for the, and now I will mangle this Madagas Malagash uh, name, Rano Hampiovarta, which translates as Water for Progress, project in Madagascar. Jonathan has over nine years of experience working to increase access to water and sanitation services in rural Madagascar. Jonathan gave a similar presentation to the one he will give today at the RWSN conference last December in uh, Kampala, and he won some uh, sort of best in show award for it. So I, I'm very much looking forward to today's presentation, and it is with special pleasure and anticipation, therefore, that I now turn the microphone over to you, Jonathan. And Su Jung, you can take away my slides and bring out Jonathan's. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening to those of you uh, here in Africa. and. Uh, more towards the east. Um, before I begin, I'd like to uh, remind everyone that uh, the presentation that I'm doing today is actually based on a paper uh, which was submitted for the RWSN conference. And my co-author on that paper was uh, Gerald Zatu, who um, is unable to be with us uh, here in Madagascar today, and I have not seen his name pop up online, but uh, I do hope uh, he will be able to answer some questions here towards the end. Um, the second thing I'd like to point out is um, in any language which I speak, I do stutter. So if um, at some point during the presentation, I get stuck. I ask for your patience in that. Um, so now we'll start. And um, as you all know, uh, what I'll be presenting here today is um, some of the work that has been going on for the last six or seven years here in Madagascar to promote public-private partnerships, uh, specifically in for piped water supply systems in rural areas. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is I'm going to start with the just a introduction to Madagascar's rural water sector, uh, then talk more specifically about some 
of the basics of the PPP model um, for both the construction and the management of piped water supply systems. Then I'm going to go into three different case studies uh, showing how the approach is pin effective. Then we're going to talk about a few key factors for success and take some recommendations and discuss some obstacles to overcome as we hope to scale the model in the coming years. So just to give you um, all who are not intimately familiar with Madagascar's rural water supply uh, sector, um, Madagascar now has 21 million people, of which 70% live in rural communes. Um, it's a very, very poor country. Uh, per capita income levels are stuck in right around $400 per year. In terms of rural water supply coverage, we're, we're at 29% right now, um, which is very, very low compared to some of the other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, looking specifically at functionality, there's a little bit of disagreement as to exactly uh, what the functionality rates of the systems are. Uh, for instance, there was a report put out in 2009 by RWSN, uh, which cited a 90% functionality. We did our baseline study of the Rano Humpy Vosha program in 2010 in 42 communes along the East Coast and found it to be 20%. I'd say in actuality, um, across the whole country, it's probably between 40 and 50%, so still very, very low. To give you a little bit of background of where uh, the sector is in terms of, of having a legal framework, um, the Water Code was passed in 1999, which essentially set the groundwork for decentralization. Um, it gave a contracting authority to the communes, um, and the communes here in Madagascar are the second lowest administrative unit. So typically you'll have one larger town, and then between 20 and 60 smaller villages, which will uh, compose a commune. Each commune is uh, headed by a mayor. Um, the water code also uh, specified that water from an improved source is to be paid for, and at the same time encourage private sector investment. In 2008, uh, the history of water was established essentially to try to streamline the process of instituting many of the decrees which were found in the water code. At this point, 18 of the 22 regions have regional directors, um, and there's no other uh, people from the water ministry who are at either the district or the commune level. In practice, what that means is uh, that the Ministry of Water remains poorly funded, understaffed, and has very little, if any, presence in rural areas. As I referred to earlier, uh, there's not an accurate database of existing water points. They have tried for two or three years now to create a 
database, but the information remains incomplete. Um, and as such, uh, what happens is that these systems are installed and there's a vacuum there. So typically uh, what we do is institute community water management committees. They fail. There's no one there from the commune or from the ministry to support them. And so you see this cycle of building, non-maintenance, and failure of water systems to continue over and over. In spite of that relatively bleak picture uh, that I just painted, um, there has been a small movement over the last six years, six or seven years, to try to get the private sector to be more involved in both the uh, investments and in the long-term management of rural water supplies. The first such example of this um, was a contract initiated between San Dendrano, who I mentioned earlier, and the commune of um, Puizanic, which is about 20K south of the capital here in Antananarive. Um, the project at that point uh, was to serve a community of 6,000 persons. Uh, San Andrano and the commune received material support from the World Bank, and San Andrano put up 60% of the construction cost um, out of private funding. He was awarded a 25-year management contract, and since then, not entirely because of the water system, but uh, what we've seen is that the population in the commune has increased, and there are multiple micro-industries, such as poultry farming. Um, which have become very, very big in the area, which are dependent on the water supply. And over the next seven years, um, now it's estimated that there's about 20 piped water systems which are managed in this way throughout the country. So just to give you a little bit more of a background on San Dendrano, they've, they've really been the pioneer uh, here in Madagascar trying to get the private sector more involved in both urban and in rural areas. Um, over the past 10 years, San Dendrano has invested $400,000 of private funding into both urban and rural water supply systems, and according to Their estimates, they are responsible for uh, supplying water for over 200,000 people every day. More importantly, um, they've introduced the concept of a social water point, which is something that we'll see in all of the case studies, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And a social water point is 5 to 10 self collecting households um, who get together and they share a water point much in the same way that they would for a public tap stand. But uh, what the benefits are is that you don't need to have a, uh, a kiosk attendant there and the water is available 24 hours a day. It's typically at a place which is convenient for the whole group. And as you don't have to have the charge um, um, of paying for a water attendant, you can typically have a fee which is lower than you would for a private connection. Um, 
other than that, Sam Andrano was the founder of the Association of Private Sector Water Distributors uh, here in Madagascar. Um, they started only with nine members back in 2005, and now it's slowly grown up to 17. Uh, so the next slide is to give some of our audience who maybe is not familiar um, with how you would establish a PPP in a rural commune. This is just a generic model. Uh, there could be um, other steps that you may want to add, uh, but this is essentially um, the model which has been followed by my project and by other people who are trying to uh, promote this approach. So the first step would be would be to essentially sell the sell the concept to the communes. So you have to train the communes um, so that they understand what their roles, what their responsibilities in all this are. And if they're in agreement that this is something that they feel that would benefit their commune, um, then we move to the second stage, which is preparing tender documents, um, either for construction or for the management, depending on which type of a contract you're looking to sign. Then you would want to publish the tender documents to uh, attract the bidders. We've done that either from a national uh, call for tenders process or only targeting a small list of service providers who we know uh, have the capacity which we're looking for. After that, uh, you give the opportunity for the potential bidders to conduct a site visit, at which time they can ask questions, they can see the site. Then you'll uh, give them an additional two to three weeks to submit their tender. Uh, then the bid committees at the commune level evaluate the tenders, select, notify, and negotiate with uh, the winning bidder. Um, the next stage is actually really, really important in that in that you want there to be some face time and an opportunity for the commune and for the winning bidder to negotiate uh, specific aspects of the contract that maybe wasn't cleared during the tender process or maybe has arisen after they were notified. Um, once all of the parties are in agreement, you would sign the contract, at which time the operator would begin to operate, monitor, and report to the government um, as, to, as, to, as to how the system was functioning. So now moving on into the three different case studies. I chose these three because they um, offer uh, three examples from different parts of the country where PPPs have started or have been shown effective. The first is a community just outside of the capital in Tenerife, started by a company called Apier in 2008. Uh, the second is one of the newer systems uh, started by Sandandrano in 2009. And uh, the most recent one is a one that our project is involved with in uh, Hidrano West, which is along the East Coast in 2000. 11. So for the first case study in the commune of Fiona, uh, 
Um, it's a community of about 5,000 people. Uh, the project at that time in 2008 was supported through World Bank funding by the FEED project. Uh, the company invested $4,500 into construction of the system. Uh, today there are 73 private connections and 24 semi-private connections. All connections are metered and you'll see that that is a common thread through all of the case studies. Um, the price per unit for the water is 25 cents for a cubic meter for the household connections and 13 cents for the social connections. So important to see here at this case study is that there are no public connections. All of the people who are accessing the system are accessing it either by a social connection, as I described earlier, or a household connection. The second case study is uh, specific to Sandandranu in the commune of Ambuibari. Um, the community has 7,000 people. Uh, the project supporting the, the funding supporting the project was uh, by the EU and it was implemented by the French ONG GRET. They were awarded a 20-year manage, 20 year management contract and that's because they invested $65,000 into the construction of the system. So what you'll see is that typically the more that the uh, private sector partner invests, the longer the management contracts are because they naturally need the time to uh, recuperate their investment. Uh, the water pricing for Ambui Body is 50 US cents uh, for the public tap stands and 25 for the social connections. 50 US cents is also for the for the uh, the huh, household connections. And uh, for the third case study, the one which I am most intimately familiar with is in the commune of Anivrana West, which has of 5,000 to uh, 5,000 to uh, 100 people. Um, it was supported by USAID funding, um, and the commune awarded the Entreprise Velu with a 10-year management contract. Velu only had to put up about $4,000 of their own money into the system because, again, it was not the invest, construct, manage model. Rather, we did the construction to a private contractor and then the system was hand handed over to Velu only for the management. Today there's 53, 53 private connections and 82 social connections with two public water points. Uh, the pricing is similar to what we saw in um, Pui Body, 50 cents uh, for the household connections, 40 cents for the social connections, and 35 cents for the public water point. Just to give you an idea of uh, how much money is being generated uh, here in revenue from these systems, um, here's a chart from Hebron West tracking the water sales for each type um, of the water point. And if I just take the case of November, you see that they sold about 800 uh, cubic meters of water from the social water points 
another 400 or so from the private uh, from the private connections, and another 100 or so from the uh, public water points. And so that translates roughly into about six, $600 per month uh, here in revenues that you're seeing in Hebron and West. Uh, the small table at the bottom of the slide is just to show what the average daily water usage is. And you see for the <laughs> household connections, we are at a very healthy 43 liters per person per day. And at the social connections, considerably less, um, but much more in line with someone who was probably only using the water supply for their essential needs in the households, but, but who is very likely doing their laundry uh, with some other water source. Just to give you an idea of when we, when we come up with the water tariffs, um, what are some of the components uh, that you'll uh, <laughs> that you'll have to take into consideration. Um, it doesn't turn up very well on this slide. It seems like everything is the same color. But uh, starting at the bottom is 35% for maintenance and repair, 30% uh, for overhead costs, 25% in profit. And then the last 10% is uh, different sorts of taxes which are mandated under the water code. There's taxes for extending the system, for a sanitation tax, and um, typically the commune will add a general commune tax onto that as well. So getting into some of the key factors for success of the model. Um, the first, which which you could debate if it even really needs to be in here, um, is political will. Uh, because the context in Madagascar is still so um, non-inviting for this type of approach, it really takes a dynamic focal politician to be able to make the decision to put their water system under private management. It's certainly not going to be a very popular decision politically, um, as there will be people who will say the community is just too poor to, to afford it. However, I think as those three case studies show, uh, specifically looking at uh, uh, how much money the entreprise in on Hivrana West is able to collect every month there in revenue, there is a uh, service level which is desirable in these communities. The second is that clearly the, the, um, what has helped these three cases work is that they're in towns that have more than 5,000 people. Um, they're close to a, major, to a major urban center. They have a middle class, meaning that it's not just your typical rural, uh, homogeneous, agrarian community. But there is a, a merchant class and other people who uh, have the money to pay for these services. These are also places where cell phone networks exist, which is certainly not the case uh, for all of Madagascar, and uh, places where you do see uh, high levels of public services. 
two other key factors which I'd like to mention, and I'm going to start with the fourth one here, which is donor support. Um, as you saw, either the World Bank or the EU or USAID um, had supported financially all three of those cases. The support comes in two ways. Uh, the first and more recognizable, I think, is the financial support to help subsidize some of the construction costs. But I would argue that that even as important as the financial support towards the hardware is the support to cultivate the enabling environment within the commune itself and within the service provider so that they can provide a high level of service and so that the people understand and expect the service level for which they are paying. And um, the last key factor is demand. Um, and it's that all three of these systems provided service levels that were variant depending on people's personal preferences and their willingness to pay. And this is very, very important, and I think it sets us apart from a lot of what has happened here, certainly here in Madagascar, where there's been such a rush for the uh, one water point for every 200 person model, and there hasn't been a whole lot of questioning, well, is that really what people want? And if you start to think that you want to um, offer higher levels of service, it actually requires the technical and managerial complexity that comes with a private sector service provider. And I'm going to discuss that just a little bit more in the next two or three slides. This slide is actually adapted from Richard Carter's presentation, which he did uh, for the very first RWSN webinar series. Um, and it really struck me as, as being, as being uh, very accurate. Um, both here in Madagascar and probably in other places throughout the world. And it's what the rural consumer really wants. Um, and I would argue that the rural consumer wants no less than what all of us who are hearing this webinar want, which is all six of these dimensions which are listed below. The first being uh, reliability. They want water which is accessible 24 hours a day. The second being quantity. Way too often uh, here in Madagascar, we have built systems and say, you can only use the water for your essential needs, meaning uh, no less than 20 liters per person per day. What we saw from the previous slide from Hebron West is that there were people who were willing to pay for up to 40 liters a day. And that means that they're able to expand their services, they're able to do their laundry, they're able to, to really reap the full benefits of having the water supply. The third is access, proximity. People want a water source which is close to their homes, preferably in their yards if possible. Um, that only helps women and girls who spend uh, exorbitant amounts of their time in some parts of the country searching for water. Um, the next is the management burden. And I would say that what it should say is the reduction in the management burden. Um, oftentimes in communities where you've gone to fill water systems, you can clearly tell that, that, that it was not in uh, the best interest of the communities themselves who were charged 
put the management burden to be managing the water system. And they clearly would prefer to pass that burden onto someone else. Uh, the next one is affordability. Clearly, the water uh, has to be priced so that it is affordable to the vast majority of the population. And then, far, and then um, finally is quality. Um, and I believe that Richard was, was right on by saying it's important, but it's only one of six aspects. And I think when you start to put together some of those things, what you see emerge from this model is evidence of ownership. Um, and that seems to be what has been missing for so many of us for so many years. And what I mean by ownership is personal investment beyond the cost of installing the water point, which is a second cost, um, to conveniences which are related to the water service. On the left-hand side here, uh, it, here was a house in Anivarano who shortly after they got a private water point installed a sh shower, flushable toilet, and a clothes washing basin. Um, uh, the picture on the right hand side is from another commune that we work in in the southeastern part of the country, which um, shows that, so, which is um, that the uh, household had installed a clothes washing uh, basin closer to the water point in the foreground. This next picture is from a rural farmer who uh, was so excited when I came out to his village that he had to show me his shower contraption um, on the right-hand side of the screen because he told me that he never thought in that he would ever have the opportunity to take a proper shower. And so what he did was he took a hose from his uh, tap stand on the left and rigged up a temporary shower structure. When you see evidence of ownership such as these, it gives you real good confidence that the service in which the service provider is providing it's something that responds to the needs of the people. So getting more into uh, what the recommendations are, um, there's four recommendations. The first one is focusing um, on the private side of the pay pay. Um, here in Madagascar, it'd be great to encourage a new generation of entrepreneurs um, who can participate in these types of agreements. Right now, it's very, very limited to only a, a handful of companies um, and to cover the very great need here in Madagascar. There's a need to expand the pool of potential private sector service providers. With the expansion of that will come a need for specialized training to ensure professionalism. Uh, one way of doing that would be to expand particip participation in the association of private sector water distributors. Um, another way would be to reduce taxes. ARS and CARE, uh, when we work with money from USAID, we're tax exempt for things like VAT tax and 
importation taxes, passing on similar tax reductions to the private sector may have an impact in their ability to invest in the sector. The second recommendation is uh, more specific to, to the public side of the model. Um, we need to increase uh, demand for water in rural areas, and not just for water as we've been doing it in the past, but for high quality water services. At the same time, uh, it's clear that we need to support the Ministry of Water at the local, at the regional levels, at the monitor levels, um, to be able to uh, have their role as the regulator of all of the management contracts that would be put in place. The third recommendation is to target large rural towns. Um, here in Madagascar, we, we're still spending a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of effort going to places in extremely remote rural areas with low population densities, while there are, are Literally, uh, 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 hundreds of towns uh, in rural areas with between 2,000 and 10,000 people where uh, an approach like the pay, pay, pay could be, could be fostered. And finally is Getting back to what I was explaining earlier about ownership is that we have to recognize that even in rural areas that we consider to be poor, there is, in fact, a very high demand for private and social connections as well as a, uh, a professional level of service. Um, so I would encourage that water systems which are built in these areas offer multiple service options, even though that may incur higher construction cost for the donor um, to get us to have higher sense of ownership, that's probably where we need to be investing our money. And finally, for the last slide, um, I don't want to make it think that this is going to be just a simple process uh, for scaling up without any significant obstacles uh, which still need to be overcome, um, but just to mention only three of them here. Um, right now there's three or four contracting templates which are floating around out there. Um, the contracting, the mechanisms really need to be standardized um, if the Ministry of Water has any chance to uh, uphold their function as the regulator. Um, and getting back to what we started the presentation with is that the Ministry of Water currently lacks the physical capacity to provide the type of formative oversight uh, which is required if we want to think about going to scale. Uh, the second obstacle is to it's more about uh, the long-term profitability of the model. Uh, what you'll see here typically is that most uh, rural s service providers have only between 100 and 200 connections. And if you read in the literature from other countries, uh, it typically takes over 300 connections for it to be profitable to engage in this type of a business. And I can offer up one uh, potential reason for that. Um, and that's because in most of the business plans 
which I have seen, we don't do a very good job of incorporating what Posh Cost calls capital maintenance expenditure. So in our uh, striving to keep the tariffs relatively low, um, then we don't filled in some costs uh, which are not immediate, but after six to seven to ten years will start to need to be to be dealt with. Um, so one of the things that we need to do is to really look critically at the business plans, both for the communes that are already under contract, but certainly for all of the communes in the future, to try to make sure that they're that their financial models will, in fact, lead to long-term sustainability. And then finally, what uh, CARE and CRS are very um, attuned to and, 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 and very, very cognizant of is this question of equity. Um, in some of the communities that I've been involved with, it's pretty clear at this point that between 10 to 25 percent of the of the population are not able to uh, have access uh, to the water, meaning that they do not use the water on a regular basis. Um, so the question is. What do we do to incorporate the most vulnerable into this model, keeping in mind that we need to achieve profitability and sustainability in the long term? So that's all that I have for the presentation, but just to acknowledge that uh, the funding which we receive uh, for our project comes from USAID. We're very grateful for that. Thank you for CARE uh, and for CRS Madagascar who uh, are supporting us in this uh, very novel approach. And thanks specifically to my team um, here, Rano Hampovich. I've added my contact information if there's anyone uh, who would like to get a hold of me. After the webinar, um, I'd be happy to answer any more questions that we're not able to ask during this time. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Elizabeth. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, the questions have just been pouring in in the chat box, and I know we're only going to get to a very few of them. So I hope that perhaps I can prevail upon you that we will send you the, the written questions from the chat box, and perhaps you could uh, give us some written answers to them that we could then post on our, our website as some uh, small effort to reach to more of the questions. I apologize for the technical problems you were having. Our PDF screen um, froze, and so the slides were not advancing properly. But now we're back to uh, PowerPoint, so I think that problem is, is over. Um, let me then turn immediately to introducing our first discussant, Alain Locusol. Alain has 45 years of international experience with urban and rural water supply and sanitation, of which 25 years were spent with the World Bank. Uh, needless to say, even a summary statement of Alain's experience is very long, so I really just have to pick and choose a few things to say. Um, I, I would like to start by saying that he is a civil engineer by training. We sometimes have too few of those involved in our water projects. He has been closely associated with the bank effort aimed at improving the efficiency of the urban water supply and sanitation service through public-private partnerships since the mid-1980s. Uh, please look on the World Bank website if you would like to read the publications that he has co-authored on this subject. Between 1997 and 2003, Alain led the policy dialogue and the project preparation, appraisal, supervision, and evaluation of urban and rural water supply and sanitation projects in Kenya, Madagascar, 
Tanzania and Uganda. He was also working in other countries in Africa at the same time. And he is extremely proud of the former Bank Rural Water Supply Project in Madagascar. So with a very summary introduction, Alain, let me now turn the microphone over to you. Alain, have you unmuted your microphone because we don't hear any talking? Alain, are you there? We seem to be. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. I was uh, afraid yeah, we lost you. I'm sorry, I was, I was disconnected. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Liz, and yeah. thank you uh, very much, Jonathan, for the excellent presentation on Madagascar. I'm pleased to see that. Uh, things are moving a little bit in uh, Madagascar and the main uh, 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 subject of my uh, intro the discussion is really about the scaling up of these uh, pilot initiatives. Uh, I believe that uh, it would be very interesting to tell the uh, crowd that is uh, currently uh, connected to this presentation if there is any uh, estimate of the overall investment uh, required for uh, serving all the small towns and large villages that might be interested in getting a small pipe water supply system. Uh, the uh, other, uh, uh, this is something that we didn't get very much from the from the, the presentation is uh, what is the uh, level of investment that has been uh, per cap the level of investment per capita that has currently been uh, uh, put together in uh, in these uh, schemes. The, uh, I saw that many questions came about the role of the government and I believe that if we want to scale up this very interesting initiative, the government would have to play a key role in providing grant money uh, to make sure that the schemes uh, can be financed and that the, the service can be affordable. affordable. Uh, I uh, think that it would be interesting if you can tell us if uh, traditional donors, you mentioned the World Bank, USAID, but or the donors have been interested in funding, in financing this type of uh, this type of activity. Uh, one other thing that uh, came out during the discussion, and I believe that uh, uh, that's something that we need to discuss, is uh, where is the local financing coming from? Uh, I suppose that there is some equity being put by the promoters of these uh, small schemes. But at one point in time, uh, these people would have to uh, uh, rely on uh, commercial uh, loans. And have there been any approach with local banks to find out if uh, they would be willing, uh, under certain conditions, uh, to uh, provide some funds to complement the amount of money that would be provided by uh, the government through uh, international donors? Uh, another issue about the uh, profitability of the schemes, I mean, what we have seen in particular in Uganda that uh, started this uh, experience with the private operators of small pipe water supply systems is that it's very difficult to uh, uh, ensure profitability of schemes on, on, on one scheme. And very often you have to regroup uh, schemes to make sure that uh, the economies of scales can be implemented by the promoter operator of the, of the schemes. Is that something that is possible in Madagascar? I know that uh, Madagascar has a uh, uh, difficult communication problem, that the density of villages and small towns is pretty low, and that might not be, uh, might not be uh, that easy, as, as easy as it is in, uh, in the case of Uganda. Uh, everybody mentioned the issue of uh, standardization of tender documents uh, the, the, and the issue of tariffs. Uh, this is something also that I would uh, think should, uh, the discussion should focus on is, is the government willing, willing to accept that tariff or the differentiated uh, uh, according to the various uh, various uh, schemes that are being implemented. Uh, in some schemes, uh, if we can rely on gravity source, I understand it's going to be much uh, cheaper than if we have to pump and treat the water. Uh, but uh, is the government, has the government been associated with the, these issues? Uh, at one point in time, the government is to take the leadership if uh, this initiative has to be scaled up. This is what I wanted to say. I believe that uh, my colleagues uh, uh, who, uh, uh, from the World Bank may have some uh, some uh, additional point to add uh, on uh, this uh, issue of uh, scaling up of these initiatives. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alain. And I, I believe that Christophe will probably be pursuing some of the issues you raised. So let me quickly introduce Christophe, who is sitting here next to me. Christophe has a master's degree in agricultural development from the Sorbonne University in France. Prior to joining the bank, Christophe worked for 17 years with NGOs and consulting engineering firms in various countries in Latin America, Asia, and Africa in the field of rural development and rural water supply and sanitation. Christophe joined the bank in 2001, where he worked for seven years in the Africa region and three years in New Delhi for the water and sanitation program. In Africa, Christophe managed successfully rural water supply projects in Rwanda and Madagascar, conducted water public expenditure reviews, and participated in about 15 development policy lending operations on rural water and sanitation reforms. In South Asia, Christophe focused on decentralized rural water service delivery reforms and drinking water security. Christophe currently works in Latin America and the Caribbean, managing water and sanitation projects in Peru, Paraguay, and Haiti. Christophe, I turn the microphone over to you. Uh, it's going to um, take a, uh, just a minute here. I'll keep you informed of his progress. Okay, yeah. Yes. Th thank you, Isabel. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. I think people can uh, can really uh, get a sense of uh, this uh, rural water PPP initiative uh, in Madagascar. I think uh, it's um, it's a, a very interesting initiative. I'm happy to see that uh, what I've started a few years ago is still uh, is still on. Operator are still in the business. I think which um, demonstrate that. Uh, there is some sort of uh, sustainability, and uh, even uh, given all the problems faced by, by the country, and on other on other at the same time, I think that the, the what I, I I do notice that the, the number of operator water operators has, has not yet increased uh, very much over the last five years. It's still about uh, uh, around 20 of them. Uh, it means the one who have started are still in the business, but no newcomer or very little uh, have come. That is, it's, it's very, um, it's quite worrisome. I think we we have to to w ask us why there is no more uh, progress in this field. Um, what I really, um, I think you described very well the situation. What I really like in your presentation, you know, it's it's a demand uh, demand side. I think the it's true that people are really uh, asking, uh, uh, you know, requesting a, a level of increased level of service compared to to uh, five or ten years uh, back, and most of them they are they are ready to pay uh, uh, to pay for the service. And I think it's this initiative showed that uh, if we are able, uh, if we want to answer to the the the, the people demand. It means it's a higher level of service, and it means also we need professional service operator. And I think the <laughs> this uh, operator offers a good a good solution. <coughs> it shows also that uh, even though it's a private operator, there is a, there is a, a tariff which is uh, which fit the the, the 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 affordability of the poorest people. And I think this part is very interesting. Uh, what I, uh, you know, uh, what I get from this presentation and this uh, five, seven years experience in in Madagascar, I think it's still fine. Rural PPP is still very, uh, very possible for small town, as you demonstrate. I think it's much more difficult for smaller villages. Um, and I think there is also some, you know, it's as you mentioned, there is um, there are a lot of small towns in Madagascar. In, in other country too, and I think still the the, the number of uh, contract is is very limited. I think it's uh, in Madagascar is no more than uh, maybe uh, less than uh, five percent of uh, contract signed out of the the whole number of uh, small town uh, which exists in, in in Madagascar, and so I think there is no just technical uh, issue. There is not just the fact people who doesn't want to pay. Or, but there is maybe some sort of uh, political resistance, 
and I think we we have to to you know to to not miss uh, the objective of our job is which is to provide water to people and maybe we have uh, instead to force at, uh, in one direction uh, which is a real water PPP uh, I think we we have to stay open to other alternative uh, management model I think I'm s still thinking there is some uh, some future in, in the professionalization of community management in uh, in some sort of cooperative and uh, because if you look at the urban water sector you know it's even the so far after all the the the, the work done on PPP this PPP contract remains uh, a small number still maybe less than five or ten percent so I think that we still uh, we have to push for PPP for small town I think there is a, a real uh, uh, possibility but we we have also to think uh, to stay open to other alternative model and uh, that I will stop here thank you Thank you very much, Christoph. Let me now quickly move to introducing our uh, third discussant. Uh, Sylvain graduated in water sciences from Louis Pasteur University of Strasbourg in France. His professional skills are in water, public finance management, and policy dialogue. Prior to joining the water and sanitation program, he has worked as senior water and sanitation specialist for the Dutch cooperation unit in the Netherlands Embassy in Benin. Uh, Sylvain joined WSP in 2006 and is now based in Cotonou as the country coordinator. Currently, he is working on the WSP, IFC, and Global Partnership for Output-Based Aid that is working to promote domestic private sector participation. Uh, the focus is on small town water service levels and delivery through PPP contracts and through innovative financing mechanisms. I think this introduction makes clear why I have asked Sylvain to be a discussant today. So without uh, further ado, let me turn it, the microphone over to you, Sylvain. Okay. Thanks, uh, Elizabeth, and thanks, Jonathan, for this presentation. <coughs> what I have to, to say right now is that this presentation is a good experience of, of some arrangement between public and, and private for provisions or service with partial or partial transfer of risk to the private. But for, for the PPP, if I come back to the presentation, the PPP is, a, is something broad than that. That's the reason why I like you to elaborate on the other part, because it's clear that in your presentation, you had clear view on the way the contracting process is, is leading. But for the financing, for the capacity building, and for the performance monitoring of what private sector are, are do, is doing with the public is not, is not well elaborated. I'd like you to, to come back on this point. And my second part of my comments is about the public sector, because we cannot have PPP without public capacity. Uh, we, I say that in your presentation that the public capacity actually in Madagascar is very weak. And for that, in the experience we have in other parts in, in, the, in the world, actually, we can um, waiting to, 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 to construct or to build the public capacity. We can, we can call the expertise from the third parts for the business developments. And now in Africa, in West Africa, we, we have some experience with in using the business super development services to cover the issue like performance monitoring, capacity building, to alert the private sector to have credibility to interact with the commercial bank for the financing. I, I would like you to, to come back to this aspect. Apart from contracting process and management processes, how you're dealing actually in Madagascar with financing and with capacity building. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, for, uh, Sylvain. Um, unfortunately, we, we don't have very much time left, and I do want to get to at least some of these uh, huge number of questions that have been flowing in from our participants. So rather than Jonathan uh, responding to the discussant remarks 
directly. I think I will ask uh, Su Jung to now bring out our question and answer pod, and um, we will um, focus on, on trying to answer a few of these. Again, there have been so many questions that I am going to ask uh, Jonathan and his team if perhaps they could respond in writing to some of the questions that we uh, will not be able to get to. But for the time being, let me turn the, the microphone now over to our uh, facilitators to uh, read out the first question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. In fact, this qu first question here, or the set of questions, echoes some of Sylvan's comments at the end there. Um, from Adise Amado Dube in Ethiopia. If the water ministry is underfunded and understaffed, how is it monitoring and managing the contract with the private companies? And Thelma Trish, you mentioned that operators or the communes report to government on how the system is operating. Does central government monitor the performance? How do the communes organize the supervision and enforcement activities? And do the communes get ongoing technical support for supervision? And the last question, which links um, to the, the two above from Susan Davis, is how long will these setups last without care involvement? Let me hand the mic back over to you, Jonathan. OK, Kirsten. Uh, and thank you for your questions. Um, starting, starting with the first one here. In fact, uh, the water ministry doesn't do a whole lot of day-to-day -day management of these contracts at all. Um, they're a signatory, um, and they know that uh, the system is working in the rural areas. Um, uh, but unless they do regular monitoring visits, uh, which oftentimes they do not, they only uh, hear about the systems, one, when there's a problem. Um, and for instance, the mayor from the commune will go up the line to the district and to the region and tell the regional director about the problem. Or um, the private sector service provider is required to send in uh, six months reports. So twice a year, both the commune um, and the water ministry get a report on uh, on what's going on with the system. What you have in there is a financial report, how much water has been sold, how much water uh, has been lost in the pipeline, um, how much money they've recovered, um, as well as all of the different types of maintenance, repair, and investments which uh, have been made over that time. Um, but it's true. I mean, it's a real, it's a real, real issue. Uh, the, 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 the central government does not physically have the capacity at the moment to do a good job of tracking um, in any more frequent of a basis than that report. Um, and for the second question, uh, I think I've already answered that with uh, with the response there. It's 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 a it's a six month report, and uh, if they have any problems, then then they they can come to the commune and ask, or they can just call the the service provider. Um, and the question about you know what happens after care leaves, we're we're all of the systems that we will have built will all be under contract by the time that our project is over. And we'd like to give at least four to six months of us still working on the ground trying to support that relationship before the service provider and the commune before we stop. Um, 
that's about as good as we can do. Our funding from USAID is very limited, um, and both in the amount of funding and in the scope of time that we uh, have to implement this project. Uh, hand it back over to Kirsten for the second hi, hi, set of questions. Hi. Hi, Jonathan. It's Sean. Um, great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, we've had a couple of questions around the issues of water quality and catchment protection. So Abba Jaffu um, Shamasundan says, uh, which organization takes care of water quality and surveillance? Then Carla Singh asks, uh, would there be a designated group to enforce catchment protection? And Thomas asks, what is the water resource availability uh, in the long run and the influences of climate change and the cost of managing the resource and who is in charge of resource protection so uh, a range of issues there around uh, water quality and water resources thank you sure okay um, starting at the top in the contract it specifies that um, during the six-month period um, before the reporting as I explained to before, the service provider is required to do a full sweep water quality uh, surveillance, right? So they'll get a water, they'll take a water sample and they'll send it off to one of the national labs uh, here in Tana to test its quality. Now that happens twice a year. On a daily basis, the systems which we are install are chlorinated, so, so all the water um, has a chlorine residual, uh, which is measured and is tracked on a daily basis um, on site by the service provider. Uh, catchment protection. In the contract, in fact, um, one of the things that's an annex to the contract is a delineation of the water catchment area. Um, so specifically for the gravity flow seams. Sometimes this is very large if you're, if you're using an intake system from a small river. Other times it's much more manageable um, using an intake system from a spring or a small group of springs. Um, and in the contract it says that it's actually the communes responsibility to, uh, to manage the water, the watershed. Um, and in fact, in one of the instances that I'm thinking of, we actually had to come in there with the commune early on and to revocate some people who were living within the watershed. So that's not a responsibility that would be solely put on the service provider, but there needs to be um, a lot of support from the commune in that process. Um, and the question about water resource availability, I, I think it's a very good one. And what I had alluded to earlier during the presentation is that if we're going to make a shift to not, for instance, installing 20 water points in a community of 4,000, but install, you know, uh, uh, install uh, private connections and such. Um, what it means is that we need a, a, a lot more water um, than what we've been accustomed to needing in the past, and specifically with the effects of climate change, we are seeing that it's harder and harder to find a source that has the capacity to meet the needs of the community for a 10-year design life. Um, I don't know of any, right now, um, of any schemes that are looking into ecosystem services and looking into uh, going on to the credit markets um, to try to find some 
um, sort of a subsidy for that. But that could be a good idea uh, for the larger systems, which have much larger water catchments. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Very, very interesting and clearly lots of thought also going into the future. I suspect we're only going to have time for one more question, although we've actually grouped about 12 different sets of questions, um, but we will get those to you. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is about PPP design and particularly about community involvement. So, Hedrun Sog, terrible pronunciation, I'm sure. How were the consumers involved in the design of the PPP? And from Dr. Alberto Pombo, are consumers part of the management? Are they formally included in the management decisions, like fixing prices and deciding where to put a social point? From Sanjay Singh, what's the role of the community once the scheme is commissioned? And from Ojibade Olukun in Nigeria, um, about the issue of community participation in the management. So let me hand over to you there, Jonathan. Okay, Kirsten. Um, can I just ask that you keep all the questions up on the screen until the end, or else I'm going to forget. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. Starting about at that. the top. Um, yeah, that's fine. Um, so, how were the consumers involved in the design of the PPP? Oh, what we do is we sell the approach, right? So we so we so we bring out pictures of what a uh, private connection looks like, what a social connection looks like, what it's all about. We we go through a is through a very, very long process. It's a three it's a three step process. It's a, um, in which we introduce the idea, we get their feedback, we listen to their um, to their suspicions. Um, we ask them if they know of other communities where the water systems uh, have stopped working. It's so, so common in the rural Malagasy landscape to, to be driving by a town with a defunct water system that most everyone knows um, where there is a system which is not working. And then you step through the process of asking why was it not working? Um, and you go through um, explaining to them all the possible factors. And at the end, um, people are actually really excited that, one, they can get a water point really close to their home. So they don't have to share with the whole community. Um, they can get uh, high levels of service. Um, and we can do it at a price which is affordable. Um, the second question, how, were, how is the community involved in fixing prices? Well, they're not really. Um, we fix prices based on the business plans which come back from the different bidders. Um, and each one of the bidders will have their own pricing structures uh, depending on their overhead cost, their levels of risks, um, and really what the management structure is going to be that they're going to implement within the community. Now, the Consumers certainly um, have the final decision as to where to put the social water points. We leave that totally up to them. Um, and we encourage them to put it in a place which is safe, for one, and which is um, accessible by all the people who, who are sharing the water points. So that decision is solely in the hands of the consumers. Um, what has been the role of the community once the system has been commissioned. Really, all that we ask of them is to pay their bill on time. I mean, that's essentially it. Uh, the other things that we ask of them is to build a fence if they have a social water point. Typically, for the private 
water point, you don't need a fence because it's already within their yard, which is a fenced in area. Um, the other thing that we that we encourage, of course, is uh, to to uh, dispose of the wastewater in a uh, sanitary way. So we encourage uh, people to do composting. We encourage people to do soak pits because what you'll see sometimes is that you've just got all this water and it's kind of stagnating closer to people's homes. Um, so that is a responsibility that we encourage after the water point has been built. Um, how were the consumers involved in the design of the of the pay pay pay? I think I, I, not really. Jonathan, I'm sorry, I have yeah. to interrupt. Um, so Joe, take over the pod. But yeah. we're we're already over time, and so unfortunately, um, we have to respect our time. I'm I'm so sorry to interrupt you, sure. but thank you to everybody very much indeed. And um, everybody will be getting an email with um, the link to the recording for today. And also eventually, again, I hope that we'll have uh, posted written questions to the webinar. Next week, we'll be having Katerina Fonseca um, talking about life cycle costing. And Jonathan, of course, gave a beautiful introduction uh, to the importance of this by mentioning how it figures in his own uh, project. Could I please ask you to, to use social media and spread the information about these webinar uh, series to your own uh, networks? And see you next Tuesday. I'm sorry for running over by a minute. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, Jonathan.